other contemporary is uh, a contemporary art gallery that focuses mainly on Asian contemporary art. Um, it's, we started in Bangkok in 2010 um, and then opened up later that year here in this space in the Lower East Side. Um, we really focus strongly on um, creating an avenue for, for, uh, for exhibition for a lot of emerging Southeast Asian artists. Um, but my specializa specialization was originally in Chinese and East Asian art, so I did quite a lot of programming with that as well. Well, I mean, I was, my background is in art history, and uh, I started specializing in Chinese contemporary um, in my studies. And then I ended up moving to China, and I was director of Red Gate Gallery in Beijing for a number of years, and then uh, did graduate work in Bangkok at Chulalongkorn University for Southeast Asian Contemporary Art. Um, so it was logical that when I started my gallery, I was going to focus in those areas. Certainly, but uh, it, it differs a bit depending on which region we're talking about. Uh, Chinese art, Chinese contemporary has gotten a lot of traction in the past decade. Okay. Um, and uh, the audience is, is already somewhat, I mean, it's, it's certainly a niche audience, but it's uh, sizable. Um, there are a lot of uh, significant collectors in New York of, of Chinese contemporary, and that audience is growing. Um, for other for other countries and other regions, uh, a lot of that is emerging. The Southeast Asian art, uh, the countries that I deal with with Southeast Asia, we don't have quite as big of a following as we do for some of the uh, some of the visual expression from Japan or Korea that seems to be a little bit more familiar to the New York audience. So I'm building that, um, which is part of the reason I do a lot of educational programming with. Uh, with the exhibitions I do that are from Southeast Asia, to really get get people acquainted with uh, with the countries themselves, the history, and the history of uh, and the art history of those places, and I get a lot of assistance in a lot of these places from the diaspora that's already here. For example, from Filipino Americans or Thai Americans, um, who either uh, find some solace and, and some nostalgia in in the work that I have here and like to have a connection to their home country or in some cases when people are second generation, it's sort of a, it's a discovery that they're making of their own heritage that they are responding to. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know exactly how to answer it except for the fact that when I, um, it, I mean it's similar with the, with the other media that I work with, um, except for some reason photography has to really, really, really me when I see it for me to want to show it um, and in this case we have something that I would call sort of a step beyond um, in terms of medium this is a step beyond digital photography because we're not talking really about straight photography in the sense that we're dealing with landscape and traditional uh, straightforward portraiture or um, capturing uh, genre scenes or everyday life or even something sort of based in more of a formalist rubric um, what we have with Niccolo, where a lot of the artistry is, is not necessarily in the picture taking itself, but the stylization of the photographs. They are all very carefully um, art, art directed by Niccolo, which is, I think, where you get the real magic here. He prints his work on, uh, he does these as archival prints on canvas. Um, so you do sort of get this, this elevation to this more painterly material. Um, and then certainly when you when you combine this with his sort of performance within this, his uh, his stylization of his models and his whole uh, creation of this fanciful um, scene uh, with each one, it's it's definitely something that goes beyond just digital photography. So I think that's an important thing to consider with this. And it was simply and it was that kind of iconography and style that uh, really drew me to his work and the hyper realism. Um, well, I really respond to the hyper-realism. I respond to uh, his intense stylization of his models. I'm um, a big influence on Niccolo um, is the artistic pair Pierre et Gilles from France, who uh, were active mainly in the 80s and 90s. And I was a big fan of their work. And then when I saw his, what I saw was something 
that seem to have more of a straightforward agenda, specifically um, with the Catholic imagery um, and, and, and something that seemed to be particularly relevant coming out of, uh, coming out of the P Filipino visual culture. And I really, I, in general, I really respond to these sort of uh, melting pot type, um, type uh, types of expression where you get to see, where you can sort of pick out veins of this and veins of that. That's something that always really intrigues me. And I felt like Nicola's work really was a, a wonderful combination of these different aspects. One does see it, um, but the, the direction that it takes can be very different. For example, the way I would characterize um, Niccolo's uh, focus on religion, and specifically Roman Catholicism, is in some ways sort of a love letter to his Roman Catholic upbringing in the Philippines. Um, we see a really, we, I think we see a real reverence in a lot of it. Um, we see where we see, I think, sort of the seeds of his inspiration as a visual artist. Um, we even we've even talked to him about this, and we know how, uh, as a child, he was uh, his parents would discourage him from playing with dolls, and instead they would replace them with these uh, images of Catholic saints. Um, and he then took great pleasure in, in dressing them up in different ways, which was very consistent with um, what. What they what Filipinos do in the Catholic Church there is is dressing up these statues of saints and parading them around for very various festivals. Um, so there is so that sort of that sense of pageantry of this is something that he definitely uh, held very important and and shows us and shares with us through his artwork. Um, now at the same time, there's an indictment of of Roman Catholicism in some of his work. It's gentle in some ways. Um, but it can be bracing. I mean, there are definitely issues that he has with um, the political side of the Catholic Church, and particularly um, their handling of, of safe sex or, uh, and, and these kinds of issues. And, and definitely the, uh, the issue with homosexuality is something that he addresses. But I would say he addresses it in a gentle, almost tender way. Um, it's almost a sort of pleading um, we can see it with uh, the the uh, Mater Dolorosa Protectress, where it, um, it's, which is a piece he won't show in the Philippine in the Philippines, where he has um, the Madonna dressed up sumptuously um, and 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 crying and looking very uh, in, in a very pleading way as she's holding out the condom. Um, so this is not something that's meant necessarily to shock. Um, it's not meant to ridicule. Um, the, the imagery itself is certainly, I don't think, blasphemous, but it's rather, his, uh, I think it's something rather that he, um, he's actually using, um, the, he's actually using the, the Virgin to intercede in a very, in a very uh, traditionally Catholic sense on his behalf, almost pleading for, um, for what he considers to be a more humane policy um, for humanity. Um, so we see that I think frequently in a lot of his work, where there's a where we might initially be shocked by the imagery because it we, it combines a sort of a sense of tradition um, with a sense of contemporary eroticism, and I say contemporary because we've seen it before with Bernini um, and lots of other artists who are centuries old, where they where they, where they do blur that line between spiritual and sexual ecstasy. Um, with Nicola, the only thing that is different is that we have more contemporary imagery. Um, and I think that can be a shocker to some people. And I think there's, especially among, I think especially among people who are sensitive to political activism in this sense, um, there are going to be people who I think are going to be overly sensitive and might find some of the word blasphemous, when in actuality, I don't really think that's where he's coming from. That's something I have, I have to say I haven't really thought about because it's very difficult for me to think of photographers who operated in that way who did not do that. Um, yeah. uh, we see lots of, from the, from the we, usually the date given for the beginning of photography is around 1839. Um, and almost from the very beginning you start to see these personifications and very often they're self-portraits. Um, 
Uh, we sell a lot of them with early photographers in England, most famously Julia Martyr Cameron. Um, uh, I'm sh I can't think of a, an example right off hand where she used herself specifically, but we certainly see that with uh, Marcel Duchamp, um, where, uh, where it's really the same idea, these sort of stylized uh, personifications where people essentially play dress up and take pictures of themselves. Um, so um, I would say that with him as well as these other artists, there's this, uh, I think, a desire for involvement. Um, and in the sense where, in, for, perhaps, I mean, this is really, really bouncing this theory out onto the wall to see where it might go. But I mean, I, I could also imagine it because there is a bit of a disconnection in terms of gesture that you would not have with, with painting or drawing where you are literally connected to it with your hand or your brush or in the case of sculpture with your chisel or your molding or however you're producing it. With photography, you've got a machine where there is air in between you and what you're photographing um, without this sort of hands-on approach. And I would say sort of inserting one's own person into the photography is a way I think where artists can feel a sense of intimacy with, with their own artistic production that they might feel like they're missing otherwise, but that's really just a, a guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just a bridge that sort of disconnect from, exactly. from the camera. And exactly, the camera. it really gives you the impression that you're hands on it. And, and Niccolo, in fact, does uh, use himself as personifications, um, and, uh, particularly in the, um, the works that we have in the front. Uh, we have three different personifications of, of himself as the altar boy, which is the title of the show. No. No, not at all. Um, absolutely not. No, I, there are a number of excellent Filipino artists. There's another Filipino artist I represent named Lenore Lim, who's a printmaker. And so her work is completely different from everything we see with Niccolo Cosme. Um, it's, it's more natural and abstracted. Uh, well, abstractions of natural forms uh, rather than a completely different animal from, uh, from Niccolo's uh, stylized sort of personifications. But, um, you know, the Philippines has a rich uh, art history. Um, the, uh, the uh, uh, what was it, the Academia de Dibujo y Pintura was established there um, in the early 1830s, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and, and fine art in the Spanish tradition was taught there with, with teachers from Spain. And then you very early with, uh, uh, you had very early uh, excursions uh, by Filipino artists going to study in Spain and even winning top awards in Spain during the 19th century for their painting um, and then brought this right back and enlivened Filipino art uh, where it continued to flourish during the 20th century and as we have moved into the 21st the fruits of uh, the fruits of all that effort I think have, have continued to uh, continued to uh, to come out um, and, you know, all, a controversial figure, though she is, um, uh, Marcos, uh, during her reign, so-called reign, you would say, uh, Imelda Marcos, uh, while she is certainly associated with horrible excess, um, she was definitely someone who spent a lot of money and attention on artists um, and the Filipino art scene, which kind of, which definitely helped a lot of Filipino artists develop and be taken seriously, not only in the Philippines, but also in the international scene. Where can we find more about Talibet com Contemporary? Um, you can find more about uh, our gallery on the website, which is uh, talibetcontemporary.com. Um, we also uh, have a nicely put together Facebook uh, fan page, Talibet Contemporary. Um, I would say those are probably the two places you'd want to go. Thanks. Thank you so much. And finally, again, that's what kind of question <laughs> is. Uh, what's next for uh, Talibet in the, in the coming months? Um, well, we, we close uh, for the period between Christmas and New Year's. Um, we've extended Nicola's show because of its popularity through January. Um, and we have some exciting things that we're going to be announcing for, for the beginning of February. 
but uh, in the upcoming year we're probably going to have uh, more Filipino work, we're going to have more Thai work, more, more work from Southeast Asia, India, China, um, and some really exciting things coming out of Japan as well. So it's going to be a busy year. Great. Thank as you well so as much. as well as presences in art fairs in uh, L.A., uh, New York, San Francisco, oh, really Miami. Yeah, yeah, Houston. Yeah, we stay on we we stay on the road a lot. <laughs> Great. It's good to hear. Thank you so much, Tally, for having us here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.